since the term phenomenology appears in more than one context. Examining this question, it's probably good to spend a few seconds on disambiguation. The term first came into prominence during the Enlightenment period, when philosophers such as Kant and Hegel began using it. However, phenomenology in its modern philosophical sense began with the work of the Czech-German philosopher Edmund Husserl, who lived from 1859 to 1938, and has continued to the 20th and 21st centuries. Basically, modern philosophical phenomenology is about trying to provide an account of how things appear to our awareness, and ultimately, how the world appears to us in terms of our subjective experience of it. In other words, phenomenology is about reflecting upon our everyday experience in order to gain some sense of its underlying order, structure, and coherence. Within Husserl's framework, the usual way we see reality is in terms of what he calls the natural attitude. However, in contrast to the natural attitude, it is possible to adopt a phenomenological attitude, wherein we suspend or bracket our belief in the natural attitude by recognizing that it is just that, a kind of belief. Within the broad scope of this project, there are two basic variants. Pure phenomenology, which is also sometimes known as transcendental phenomenology, is the type of phenomenology associated with Husserl. Over the course of his career, Husserl further divided pure phenomenology into what are known as its static and genetic forms. However, in contrast to pure phenomenology, existential phenomenology is a type of phenomenological inquiry associated with later thinkers such as Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and Jean-Paul Sartre. Where we proceed through our lives with the common natural belief that the reality we inhabit is fundamentally separable from our subjective experience of it. That the world is out there relative to our experience of it. Note that this is very different from disbelieving in the natural attitude. This act of bracketing, which is sometimes known as the epoche, allows us to turn our attention to the ongoing activity of consciousness through which our experience of reality is ultimately constituted. Husserl calls the overall act of using the epoche to reveal this experiential terrain the phenomenological reduction. The basic shift in perspective that comes from employing a phenomenological reduction to assume a phenomenological attitude toward our experience can produce some surprising insights into the fundamental nature of things. For instance, from the point of view of the natural attitude, a minute of time is simply a minute of time, regardless of how or where we spend it. However, from the point of view of the phenomenological attitude, a minute of time depends on how we actually experience it. For instance, a minute of time may pass very quickly for us if we're excited, or very slowly if we're bored. The upshot here is that the meaning of time can vary considerably depending upon whether we're viewing it from the perspective of the natural attitude, or from that of the phenomenological attitude. But, of course, the same thing applies to all the other facets of our lives. Their significance varies quite a bit, depending upon whether we're viewing them from a natural or a phenomenological perspective. This is part of what makes phenomenology an adventurous activity, because phenomenology involves becoming aware of the basic structure of our lives, things like the nature of reality and consciousness, and exploring them instead of just taking them for granted. Although the specific techniques for doing this are somewhat complex, let's take a few seconds to give you a general sense for them. As Husserl describes in one of his main works, 
a work called Ideas, the way to go about exploring consciousness is to undertake a search for what he calls its essences, or idos. That is, the features of our experience that are both necessary and invariant, and that consequently make our experience what it is. But how does one do that? Once one has turned one's reflective awareness toward experience by employing the phenomenological reduction, one can then undertake a second reduction, called nidetic reduction, with respect to some more specific question, such as... What makes a dream a dream? What Husserl is after is a special moment in the inquirer's reflective awareness, a moment that he calls an intuition, in which the inquirer realizes the essential nature of, say, a dream. The eidetic reduction helps bring about an intuition into something's essence by employing a method known as imaginary variation. In imaginary variation, the inquirer varies all the possible attributes of an experience as a way of exploring what is truly necessary for it to be what it is. To explore what makes a dream a dream, for instance. For example, would it still be a dream if nothing weird ever happened in it? Would it still be a dream if I couldn't remember having fallen asleep beforehand? Would it still be a dream if my consciousness felt sharp, rather than slightly fuzzy, etc.? Hopefully this kind of exploration helps the inquirer have a special moment of intuition, a kind of aha moment, in which he or she realizes the experience's overall essential nature. As Husserl once famously characterized his project, back to the things themselves by which he meant the things as we experience them, rather than as we take them typically for granted. One of the first important realizations that appear in pure phenomenology is the realization that consciousness is intentional, which here is a technical term that's definitely not identical to the normal English word. In phenomenological parlance, intentionality denotes two things simultaneously. The intentionality of consciousness means that consciousness is actional in nature, that it is a kind of activity or doing. Second, intentionality means that consciousness is referential in nature, that consciousness is always referring to something. Let's look at an example. The kind of consciousness we have when we're dreaming involves the actual activity of dreaming. This is the action-oriented side of dream consciousness, which is sometimes known as a noesis, technically. At the same time, dream consciousness involves a referent, in this case a specific dream, which is sometimes known as a noema, technically. Basically, as Husserl learned from his mentor, Franz Brentano, consciousness is not like a box that contains perceptions. Instead, consciousness is an active, ongoing, referential process. But in terms of our subjective experience, what makes dream consciousness different from other modes of consciousness? What would the essence of dreaming be? What would be its necessary and invariant features? The answer would reside in giving an account of how noases and noamata cohere and unfold over time in dream consciousness. And the phenomenology of dream consciousness would aim at exploring how that specifically happens. Exploring consciousness in this way occupied Husserl for several decades. However, Toward the end of his life, he recast his vision of phenomenology in terms of exploring what he called the life world. Basically, the life world is the total assemblage of the entire world as we know it, including the intersubjective and social spheres. This shift in emphasis also heralded the advent of existential phenomenology, whose exponents, such as Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, and Sartre, would become household names in the decades that followed. 
Phenomenology's emphasis on exploring different states of consciousness and the life world from an experiential perspective has also helped to gain inroads into the domain of psychology. And indeed, phenomenology has inspired and influenced an entire school of psychological thought known, naturally enough, as phenomenological psychology. Basically, phenomenological psychology proceeds on the basis of the theoretical and methodological foundation established not only by Husserl, but also by the existential phenomenological thinkers who followed him. Given that foundation in phenomenological philosophy, Phenomenological psychology seeks to explore people's experiences of various psychological phenomena, such as the experience of living through major depression or recovering from drug addiction. Often this takes the form of asking people to describe their personal experiences of these sorts of things, and then applying a stepwise qualitative research method to analyze those descriptions in order to reveal their underlying psychological meaning. All in all, phenomenology's influence on psychology was also one among many forces that have invited psychology to shift its center away from being a purely objectivistic undertaking to one that is also able to embrace and understand psychological phenomena in more subjective, experiential terms. But why is all of this important? In the final analysis, why does it matter whether we explore our consciousness, or our existence, or our being, in the way that phenomenological thinkers like Husserl describe? In his last unfinished work, Husserl gives at least a partial answer to that question. For Husserl, the fact that Western philosophy and science have proceeded almost entirely on the basis of the natural attitude without truly exploring the experiential basis that underlies it, has produced a kind of crisis in both philosophy and culture, and ultimately in the world as we know it. As he writes, The crisis of philosophy implied the crisis of all modern sciences as members of the philosophical universe. At first a latent, then a more and more prominent crisis of European humanity itself in respect to the total meaningfulness of its cultural life, its total existence. For instance, isn't this a big part of why our modern world ends up giving birth to so much chaos and devastation on such a regular basis? Isn't it largely because we're proceeding through modernity with no real understanding of the most fundamental elements of our lives, such as our consciousness, our being, and existence as such. Modern phenomenology represents an attempt to address that crisis by grounding both philosophy and science, and by implication, the whole of our technological world in a thoughtful, methodical understanding of our experience our consciousness, and ultimately, the life world that we inhabit. And that's Husserl.